The last section of the day today, um, we're going to finish up the morning by talking about kind of roadmap stuff, future directions, and you know, people always like to know where where Hub Zero is is headed. Uh, and I'm not sure I know the answer because the answer depends a lot on all of you and where you're headed. Um, but Sean Rice and I are going to walk through this and get set up. I don't really want this to be too much presentation. I want to kind of go over a few things. Sean's going to go over a few things, and then maybe we can have some discussion. Uh, so I'll try not to take too long. But I, I do want to tell you sort of the, the, the world, the framework that we live in. Um, some of you probably know this already. So if we think about where Hub Zero is headed, uh, first and foremost, we always try to have at least our focus on the Hub Zero team on the primary core mission, which is what Jerry said yesterday. Research, education, and I'll add in collaboration because it kind of fits. So when we're building features or thinking about things, we're not thinking about things that my parents would use because my parents had nothing to do with research or education. Uh, but we're thinking of things that, that could be useful in an academic or a research environment. So always looking for features like that. Um, so let me just go back over how Hub Zero is developed. Uh, it's really not by this series of code monkeys, uh, but uh, first and foremost is developed by, by all the different hub projects that are out there. Every hub project says, I love Hub Zero, but it needs one more thing. And then they proceed to work on that one more thing. Sometimes they do it themselves, sometimes they pay outs, but they're, they're driving forces in all of these projects that benefit everyone else. So for example, the email digest for group discussions, you guys all cheered about that. Um, you can thank Drew Lamar, because that was cues that uh, drove that. They said, we, if we do one thing on our project, we need email digest for group discussions to do it now. And so they kind of threw their weight behind that. And uh, you know, similarly, NanoHub has pushed the point with the CD support uh, that didn't show up on the, on the uh, funding queue last night, but is a great feature. <laughs> nonetheless, um, and, and they wanted that badly, along with the, the data curation process so that they could publish compact models and the payment system that they've added so that they can take credit cards. So each one of these projects um, you know, has their own care abouts and they, they push those issues uh, and that's, that's how things get done at one level. Um, I want to mention just a few more of those, uh, give you a little bit more depth to kind of show you where it's going. This is another thing that NanoHub has been pushing, uh, this idea of uncertainty quantification. We can use computational tools right now to get exact answers, but what NanoHub wants to do is be able to handle the uncertainty around things. When you manufacture a real switch, it doesn't have an exact width and thickness or whatever. It has a distribution. It has, it's, it's sort of a you know, 10 microns plus or minus a little bit, uh, or 10 nanometers plus or minus a little bit. And so they, they've got a whole system that they've been working on. And Ali Strachan, by the way, is the, uh, the, the co-PI of NanoHub that's driving this development. Uh, but they have a whole system where you can feed in these uncertain parameters into a simulation model. They do something uh, called uh, Smolyak Sparse Grid. They do a lot of computation. They use Pegasus, by the way, uh, and, and all of that to send off uh, tens or hundreds or thousands of jobs. And then they bring the results back and they, they compute the uncertainty. And just to give you a, a picture of what this is like, um, let me show you. I think this is live for one or two tools right now on NanoHub. It'll be rolling out soon for all the Rapture tools. You see the little button now showing the spread and parameters next to any numerical value. Instead of simulating with exact values, you can choose, for example, a Gaussian distribution. You can put in a value for a mean or a standard deviation for both. And you save that, and then when you click simulate, it'll ask you a little bit more about how you want to do the analysis. Small yak, sparse grid, level three, that kind of controls the accuracy, or level two. So depending on how accurate you want to make it, you click the button and launch job. That's where it creates the Pegasus workflow and starts sending all the jobs out uh, to, the, to the computational resources. And uh, it runs for a while. It'll come back later with all of the jobs finished and stitch together all the results. And again, instead of just one result now, we can see the, C the CBEC coefficient. You can see all the dots representing all the cases. You can also explore the results and see how CBEC coefficient varies versus material thickness. Uh, these are all the, 
uh, horizontal thicknesses that we computed. And you can see uh, probability density function. What's the most likely value for the CBEC coefficient? That's the peak in the middle. And you can kind of see the, the other values that aren't likely. So this is the kind of analysis that you can do. And the reason that this is happening is because NanoHub is pushing this agenda. Uh, this is very important for their project. They want to be able to do these kinds of calculations uh, very well. So, uh, and that'll be kind of integrated into Rapture and rolling out to all the tools. Uh, another thing that NanoHub's been pushing in terms of data publication, we saw the story yesterday about using projects and kind of walking through a data publication process. And at the end of that, you get all of these assets with digital object identifiers. Uh, you might publish a molecular dynamics trajectory or a compact model, which is like a circuit model, or a database or a spreadsheet or something like that. And each one of those published things gets a digital object identifier. And if you happen to be reading a paper, you'll run across a digital object identifier and it'll represent one of those data sets that's published. And of course, you guys know how digital object identifiers work. You can look them up, resolve them, and that serial number takes you to NanoHub and shows you that data. Now normally, for most of the systems out there, the process is you publish some data, it gets published in a paper, referenced in a paper, somebody says, oh cool, I want to find that data. They follow the DOI and they get the data. Normally they get the data in terms of a file. They download a big zip file of the data or something. What we're trying to do is something, I think, a little unique and different. When you follow the DOI, and this, this is almost true, the paper part of this isn't true, but the rest of the stuff is working. So here we're looking at a, a paper. I'm reading this paper about molecular dynamics. I find a figure, I say, oh, that's really interesting, and I read the caption, and there's a DOI. Now that part's fake, but this part's real. When you follow the DOI, it de-identifies the data, but doesn't take you to a zip file. It takes you to a live viewer that you can use to visualize the data. So your first experience is not, how do I download and unpack this zip file? Your first experience is, I followed the DOI and I can immediately measure the properties of the molecule. And after I explore the molecule and walk around it a little bit, I might be interested in citing it so I can look at the citations. I might be interested in changing the angle. You know, this isn't a hard-coded movie. I can actually change the scene, walk around the data, generate my own movie, maybe, understand what it is I'm, I'm looking at, and eventually, if I'm really interested, then I can download the data. So if I, we don't want to get in the way of people downloading data, but we just want them to be able to see it before they have to download it. So, uh, so they, can, they can see the data, they can bring it down to their desktop, and then manipulate it from there. And not just data sets, but live computations too. Imagine you're reading another paper and it's talking about a simulation tool, and again, you can click the button and it brings, brings that tool right up or it brings up a particular result that's been computed. So, you know, we want, we want those DOIs to lead to live interactive experiences, not just to piles of zip files. Um, another thing that you heard mentioned a little bit yesterday, Carol mentioned this, graphics acceleration. More and more we have tools on hubs that are demanding in terms of graphics. And when you bring them up, you want them to work well. Uh, we've been experimenting recently with, uh, uh, you know, the, you run the tool client side and it seems to run in your browser. It's actually running server side using like VNC and stuff. But the hardware that we run it on, we want to support graphics acceleration. We basically want to give everybody their own graphics card in the cloud. And in order to do that, you have to find a really cheap way of buying graphics cards. So one solution is HP Moonshot, which lets you buy a drawer like this filled with computers that have graphics cards. Each little cartridge has four computers and four graphics cards, and you can put 45 cartridges in a drawer. So you can have one drawer in your rack that supports 180 interactive sessions. And those sessions can run really complicated things that, where everyone has their own graphics card. So we've been exploring this, again, under the guise of NanoHub, uh, because they want to be able to provide molecular dynamic simulation to the world and provide everybody their own graphics card. So because of that, we've been kind of exploring those, those uh, solutions. But at the same time, I think it's going to be useful for, uh, for the geospatial stuff that Carol Song's been working on and, and other projects that need graphics acceleration. All right, so that was one whole series of things where people were you know, pushing their own agenda on their own hub. Another way that this happens is that people push the agenda through the Hub Zero Foundation. 
And we have two examples of this that I, I there are more examples than this, but two that I'm kind of happy about, I wanted to mention. Um, when you go to sign into any hub, we have all these choices for sign in options. We have In Common and Facebook and Google, and we just recently added two more. And the reason we did this was because people stepped up and said, we need this, we're in the foundation, build it for us. So no innovation wanted to have an ORCID authentication plugin. And you know, do you have that? The answer was no. They said, could you build it? We said, do you want to spend your foundation hours? They said, yes, of course. So we, we built this uh, ORCID authentication plugin, um, now available in 2.0. Yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, and uh, so, so you, anyone now can use this. This is another option that's available. If you configure your hub, you can use ORCID authentication. And similarly, the guys at AFRL said, well, we have a problem. We have these government smart cards that we have to plug into that we authenticate against, and we need to be able to authenticate using those government smart cards. Can you build that? And again, they use foundation hours, and we have a plugin now uh, that uses client-side TLS certification as well. So those are two examples of things that somebody said, I really need this. And in this case, they use their foundation hours to do it, which is terrific. That helps everyone else now that wants that same capability. A third way that things get developed is from various sponsored research projects. So we heard yesterday, Carol talked a lot uh, about their project, their DIGS project that's funded by NSF. Uh, you know, this is a, a $3 million project that's going on over, over four years that's building all these geospatial um, visualization capabilities into Hub Zero. And so everyone else in the room then benefits because, you know, Carol got this grant, she's building this capability into Hub Zero, and then everybody else benefits from, from that grant. Um, there's another one, too, I wanted to mention, this uh, data center hub, um, another DIVS project funded by NSF, uh, about a million and a half, uh, and it's being led by Santiago Pujol, who couldn't be here uh, during Hub Up, he's over in Japan. Um, also, uh, you know, there are a lot of people on the project, but I wanted to mention Santiago because he's the PI, and also Anne Christine Catlin because she's, she's, her team is building a lot of the database capabilities for this project. And again, because of this project, they're, they're figuring out ways to upload data. The data has parameters uh, that they can characterize the data sets with. You can search using the parameters. So they're having you know, kind of a specific way of looking at the kind of data they want to look at. But it, with the work that they're doing, That'll give you guys more tools in the toolbox that, that everybody can benefit from. All right, so specific sponsored research projects are another way that things get added. The fourth way that things get added is by all of you guys. Whether you're, you've got your own funded projects or whatever, you're building things for yourself. And hopefully you can donate those things back to the community. In fact, that's what tomorrow's Hub Hero Challenge is all about. So, if you've got something that you want to donate, we have a form to do that. You can fill out the form. You just have to sign it once. Basically, it, it, it says that you're giving copyright to the Hub Zero Foundation when you contribute code. We do ask that you assign the copyright so that we can have one consistent copyright for the whole Hub Zero code base. If you don't want to do that, you don't have to. You can always put up your own components and tell other people to download them for your website. But if you want something to become part of the, of the core Hub Zero distribution, then you have to fill out this form, you have to assign copyright to the Hub Zero Foundation so that in the future, if we redo the code again for Hub Zero 3.0, God help us, uh, if we do that, we will, you know, if we have the copyright off the authority for your code, then we can go through that code and make the necessary adjustments. We don't have to ask your permission, we don't have to rely on you to do it. If you assign copyright, it becomes part of the core and it becomes something that we, that we maintain. So, um, so there's a process for contributing your code. Of course, we have to look at it and approve it because you, know, you can say, hey, would you like this? We can say, no, oh, thank you. Uh, it's not written the way we want it to be written. We've got coding standards. We've got you know, lots of rules to follow. Uh, but if you contribute something, if we think it'll be useful for everyone else, and if you follow the coding standards, then and if, it, if we test it, we'll test it uh, you know, for security. And if it passes the security review and everything looks good, then we can make it part of the core distribution. And we try to encourage lots of people to do that. I mentioned we've got 17 hub heroes on the wall. Uh, many of those have contributed bits of code that are already in the distribution. And we have the Hub Hero Challenge tomorrow, where hopefully we can get a whole new batch of heroes 
into the mix and contributing components. So, uh, so another way that Hub Zero grows is by the contributions that, that all of you make, uh, either by putting them out yourself or by giving them to the Hub Zero Foundation. And the last way, uh, it occasionally, and this isn't very often, but occasionally there are things that we find that we think we have to do, not because NanoHub is telling us, not because NSF is paying us, not because you guys did it, but just because we have to do it for the good of everyone. So when we're looking across all the hubs and we see that there's a consistent problem, there's something that everybody's getting tripped up on, then occasionally we divert some resources to fix it. And that's what, what happened recently when we did this framework. When we redid the framework, nobody told us to do the framework, right? You, you know, it's not like NSF says, oh, you guys should really redo your framework, or NanoHub says, hey, stop working on our features, redo the framework. They, nobody tells you that. Uh, but you, you reach a point where you realize the only way we're going to move forward on something like the framework is if we rebuild it, and it will help everyone in the process. So very occasionally we do we do something like that um, to kind of across the board clean things up. And I'm, I'm going to shift gears now and, and let Sean take over because because you know he led all the work on the, the new framework, and and he can tell you from this point on where he's planning to go next. Doctor says, "Grit your teeth, but I think happy thoughts says will be over soon." <laughs> <laughs> uh, to talk a little bit about uh, um, things, where we're going, we have to talk uh, uh, real quickly about kind of where we've been, what have we been doing in the past year. So, we'll time travel with me uh, back to last year at a, a little known uh, conference called Hobo. I sit up here and presented uh, uh, the new framework uh, or what we were calling to do too, and a little bit about where we were hoping to take and, uh, the camera at 10 pounds and a tan. <laughs> uh, so I had briefly covered just some of the uh, things that we had, were thinking about, uh, changes we had wanted to make, and some of the stuff we were hoping to work on over the next year. Uh, and I'll return to the slide here real quick. Um, but. Uh, uh, Unfortunately, at the time, Hobo had to come to an end. There was a lot of crying, wailing, gnashing of teeth, and eventually we picked up our toys and uh, went home. And that leads us to post Hubbo, which led us to post post Hubbo. Uh, and uh, we actually went right back to work on uh, our 130 framework. We started working on uh, the 131, which is primarily security fixes, bug fixes, a whole lot of refinement, and then fi finishing up and adding uh, a few features that just didn't make the cut for the 130. Uh, this is the 131 branch, which I believe is what most people are actually on right now. Probably one of our longest and most stable releases, and we are still occasionally making security fixes to that. And that uh, was actually a couple months and takes us up to about New Year's. Um, so we pause for a moment, holidays, uh, you know, take a quick breath, and then immediately after, we jumped right back into work, and this is when uh, work on 2.0 actually started. Um, that's when the 131 branch was officially kind of branched off, um, started work on our development branch, and started slowly uh, gearing up uh, development, and it ramped up, you know, nice curve, as kept getting closer and closer, more and more time, and we were working so frantic, diligently, um, that sometimes we'd even forget what day it was. You'd be at work and, gosh, it's quiet around here. Oh yeah, it turns out it's Saturday. <laughs> um, so that takes us up to about the 4th of July. 
And uh, again, we have to pause for a moment because that was where we actually had a, a couple days where we just relax and get prepared for the storm ahead. Because immediately following Fourth of July weekend, we started our QA testing. Uh, this is uh, <laughs> where our testers pretty much put us through the uh, the grinder, and uh, uh, some of us came out alive on the other side. <laughs> um, we uh, were doing the QA and test testing for about two whole months, uh, finalizing features, working on a uh, a whole new default template. A lot of work in going and making the uh, front end and the administrative side more responsive, so you could watch your iPhone and actually, you know, do stuff now. <laughs> it was uh, always been a little difficult, um, and we really kicked up the security scan. Uh, previously, we'd only really done like security scans, um, probably with major releases, and now we're doing it constantly. It's, it's pretty much always ongoing, and we can fix it as we find bugs. Um, I was happy to say that the last report we did for 2.0 before coming to Hubbub was actually excellent. I only had to make, I think, two, maybe three fixes, and it took care of a whole host of issues. So I was very happy to see that. And then that takes us up to the last week. Uh, <laughs> still feel like that. Um, and that is pretty much what's been happening the past year. That was kind of a very whirlwind tour, and it really makes me feel like Gosh, did we actually do anything? Um, so, well, let's find out. So what was actually done in the 2.0 code? Well, the first thing that uh, many people have noticed, especially in the uh, web development talk that I was doing yesterday, was a uh, whole new file structure. It was probably one of the biggest changes. Uh, that's the 131 branch, and this is what 2.0 looks like now. And even that still has some extra files and directories in it that we want to get rid of here pretty soon. So it should hopefully get even a little more organized than that. And from there, uh, we went on to uh, a number of other things. That was the original slide um, with a few extra things uh, on there. And some of the... Thank you, back There we go. Press the button, it's supposed to do the animation and not the... Anyway, uh, what I was doing was trying to cross off a few items there. Uh, some things didn't quite make it, we're only got about halfway done. Uh, Joomla uh, is actually... Um, well, that's actually the code that did get done. Or, no, sorry. Uh, a couple things only got about halfway done, you know, what's left to do. Um, that for us. Hoping to end up uh, is uh, Joomla isn't completely out of there just yet. We do still have some code that's using Joomla uh, or extending some of the Joomla uh, library. That's probably next up on our list is to fully extract that. Uh, but that actually probably ended up being a good thing for people. Um, and it gives you a little bit more time to do transitions, um, a little more uh, time to kind of get your code up to the 2.0 framework. So kind of a, a happy accent there. Um, uh, we're working on a, a, a new asset manager to make uh, managing some of the assets uh, that you can add to components, plugins, modules, all that uh, faster, easier, um, minification, and all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, we have a whole new ORM, which uh, we'll be talking about later today, and only some of our code is actually using it at this point, and that's one of our big tasks is to get everything using it which would be a, a pretty significant reduction in code. Again, I love deleting code. <laughs> um, and it should also have performance improvements uh, along with that, just because we should be reducing the number of queries and on every page load and so on. Uh, performance improvements in general, there are a number of spots in the code that I'm going to be optimizing here. Um, and we have some big tasks uh, set out for some of our developers uh, immediately after it's uh, UI, HTML structure, CSS classes, all that kind of fun stuff. Just making the hub more consistent and also putting in the necessary hooks for you to be able to style things yourself uh, even more so if you want. And uh, thinking about things like uh, uh, 
services like Slack, um, we have some people using Slack and finding that they actually quite like it. Um, and how do we integrate more with services like that? And even uh, going beyond the web framework, and even the PHP stuff, there are actually a number of uh, technologies we're looking at. Just how do we make standing up hubs? How do we make managing hubs? How do we make managing the code easier, better, faster? Uh, so we're looking, obviously, you know, things like Docker and uh, Vagrant. Um, our developer Kevin has been playing around with Vagrant quite a bit on just how do you get a, a, a dev machine up and running um, within the environment you want it with maybe a type of one line. Um, so if you're interested in some of that stuff, I point to Kevin back there. <laughs> and there's a uh, whole host of other ideas we want. I would love to jump into like one of the things that I hope to start on immediately after Hubbub is finally getting uh, truly customizable registration forms and profiles. So you can add any fields you want, um, and uh, lots and lots of other ideas. In fact, at about 9, 10 a.m. this morning, I started working on a feature to auto delete tickets by a specific user. <laughs> so it's constantly changing. We're adding new stuff all the time. Um, so, <laughs> so I suppose it's about time for answering questions, I guess. So let's turn it over to you guys. I don't know if you have questions about the framework, about future directions, or if you just want to express some opinions and ideas, but have at it, I suppose. Anything related to dinosaurs or the future uh, is good. And that dinosaurs with lasers. Uh, <laughs> yeah, dinosaurs with lasers are the future. <laughs> do, you, do you see yourselves, do you see yourselves um, more hardening the hub to be used with uh, other functionalities or Extensible to other functionalities, or do you do you see yourself uh, building those functionalities in? And, and by that, like from, obviously from our perspective, um, there are so many tools that we're, that we're looking at. As I was talking about earlier, and so we're interested in the hub becoming even more extensible to be used with those tools, rather than, for example, if you guys said, "Hey, we're doing workflow." Well, that's cool, but it'd be, it'd be nice if you made it easier for us to use existing tool sets. I'd say that's always been the we keep going back and forth on. I mean, it's even hard for us sometimes to decide, uh, just because sometimes there's these you know other tools that are out there that I mean, uh, it can get difficult for us um, because that's all they focus on. I mean, they have an entire team, sometimes twice the size of our own, and that's all they do is kind of that one thing. So they have the opportunity to make it really, truly excellent, and we would love to have that same kind of stuff within the hub. But sometimes it can get kind of difficult to actually integrate it, or maybe not even at all. So do you go down the path of just kind of making your own version of it? You know, and I, I fully admit that's something we struggle with ourselves at times. It's just, do we make our own? Do we try to figure out how we can integrate it into the hub as deep as possible? And so on. So. Yeah, we grabbed it just for the video. We grabbed the mic on this too. Because I, I, I love the point that, that Andy made and that you made about integrating other things, right? Um, I, I, I think that's, that's brilliant. Uh, the, the, the trouble you run into is when you do that, there are two problems. Number one, there can be a seam. Moving from one environment to another environment, there's a seam. Uh, and it usually has to do with authentication and, and identity. So in other words, when I'm moving into Google Docs, I need to get authorized to access this private document that was in my project, and also Google needs to know that it was me that made the changes. So when somebody's looking at it, they know who changed the document, not some you know user X five nine seven, but MMC is my. So you, you need to make that experience seamless when you're moving from one environment to another. You also then have a dependency because if Google Docs ever goes down, oh my gosh, I said the word Google, um, <laughs> then it, it would never go down. I'm sure. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> Uh, especially, yeah. Uh, the uh, but if you know if any system grant or something goes down, then all of a sudden users are are filing tickets on Hub Zero about the fact that grant is down. So um, so you need to make sure that you know when you're moving to another system, you you get rid of the seams and also that you can depend.
depend on the other system to be there. And if you can convince yourself, I mean, there's always this point at which it's more valuable to do that. The seam is not that great, and the, the other service is dependable enough that it's actually more, it's beneficial to go to the other system. Uh, in that case, yeah, we should integrate as much as we can. Uh, but there are other scenarios where, you know, something's a little bit not quite as stable and it's not integrated very well. For example, the, the track environment that we have for tools has always been a sore spot for me because it's not integrated well. Uh, and uh, so there, there are problems where, you know, when you depend on another service, it's not as good. Other questions or comments? Yeah, Jim. Whatever happened to Fez? Um, I, Fez is, is still alive. Alive and well? They, 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 they disappear. They appear. You guys want to field this? <laughs> yeah, so it's still alive. It's moving at the pace of a graduate master's thesis and not a officially supported project in some senses. Um, I was telling Nathan the other day that um, I, so just to be clear, Fez is my master's work, not Hub Zero explicitly, in the sense that I'm not working on it on Hub Zero time at the moment. Um, or so I tell them. I tell them a lot of things. <laughs> um, so that being said, when I proposed to my committee, they asked me to take a step back and really prove that it met a unique need in the market. Uh, so we kind of backtracked a little bit about that, you know, at that point. And so I've gotten past some of that, and we're kind of touching back down on um, kind of the development and, and looking at where in Hub Zero it might integrate. Um, and one of the interesting things that's come up actually since then, which is good, is some stuff from GABS related to IRODs. And one of the things that IRODs gives, I think, is something, I think they call it extended metadata. And we're looking at an interface and projects for attributing extended metadata to files and project files. Um, and one thought I had was, okay, that makes sense if IRODS is the, the storage mechanism, but what do you do for everything else? And that is, seems like a good fit. So that is one direction we might take to integrate that. Um, but that's my brief overview of where we might go as an explanation of why we're not there. That, that said, I think that the, the next step towards that is, is that um, because you can find this version of the federated system, which would go, and it's not necessarily a hub thing, although it integrates very well with hub, is that we have to um, basically roll in like a public key infrastructure into it. And that's like, you, everything else I think is pretty much working except that, right? Yeah. Because we have like uh, signatures in the files and everything else like that. So that's like the last piece we have to put in place before it goes to get the alpha, alpha version of it. So we're, we're getting there. It's, it's going slow for you. Comment for the video is we're getting there. <laughs> it helps to use the microphone because if anybody ever looks back on the video, they'll miss a lot of the comments. What is it for those of us who don't know? What is it? Yeah, uh, so, yeah, 10 second version. I, I apologize in advance if I don't get it quite right, but uh, it's basically a, a way of attaching metadata to files. So I could have a file that's sitting here on my laptop, but Fez can attach attributes to it, and it basically hashes the file, it uses the hash as a key, and then it attaches metadata um, using, is it MongoDB that you guys are using? For the storage, yeah. yeah, for the storage of the attributes. And um, So you can ask Fez about a file, and it will tell you the attributes. And I, I think Sam got it right. I'd love to see that integrated into projects, so that when you're looking at files and projects, you can have arbitrary metadata associated with each file, and the metadata is stored sort of in Fez. So that's where I'd love to see yeah, metadata overlay onto existing files wherever they live, which I love because it, it you know, I, I think the metadata in IRODs is great, but Fez could go beyond IRODs to things that are stored, you know, wherever, uh, which I think is wonderful. Well, and so that's one of, the, one of the reasons why we asked, you know, we have this um, nebulous thing that we're calling the ontology metaverse tonight, right? Thanks, Kevin. And that, the idea, right, is we, we didn't steal your idea. But it's the idea of being able to do dynamic metadata attribution, not just for files, but for research activities that exist in, in any number of databases, uh, for individual database records, right? So you can you can attribute metadata to just about anything with a DOI or system identifier or something like that. 
you know, so I said this last year, as we'd love to be a, a you know, to, to test it for you if you want, and maybe have some discussion on what we're trying to do as far as, because we want to take that beyond just files, and be able to do that attribution for any object really in the system. Because that's how we see that the only way that we can do meaningful searches in, as we move forward on, on metadata, on, on metadata searches on specific objects in a federated architecture. Uh, more on that later. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, it's good to bring up search uh, because I think search is another one of those seams that you have when you're in a large federated system and you're trying to move from one system to another. You mentioned it in your talk, search is key to that. You need to be able to search the federation as well. Other questions? Yeah. Um, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, will there be a nice upgrade script from 1.3.1 to this really massive 2.0? Uh, I hope so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> will, will we get it before next hump up? So, uh, no, I don't mean that in the first place. Yeah. No, it's a great question. The answer should be it's covered already by the package upgrade screen. No. Yeah. It has to be tested. Okay. So the answer is it just has to be tested. <laughs> The code, I don't know. Um, well, we do have uh, the migrations, I will say that. Uh, which, uh, it's a handy utility for upgrading stuff, and some of the 2.0 code will actually, uh, in combination with the migrations, will actually move things to the correct spot they need to be in. Uh, some of the 2.0 code itself will look for uh, files in the old location and properly put them in the new case, location, all that, so it's sort of self aware. Um, in that sense. As far as any other packages, uh, stuff that's outside of the CMS and framework, unfortunately, I can't really speak to that, but make to give you details. Yeah, do you want to explain more about how the, the upgrade process works? For, for this release, there really isn't anything new to the update. It's almost all migrations for the 2.0. So we have the test that makes the migration to result in the same database content and schema that you would get if you were doing a fresh install. I'll probably do that in the next couple weeks. Just a clarification on the timing. I saw a date up there, like October 21. Is that when you're sort of target for official uh, release? Oh, no. uh, back to the future. No. Oh, right. Right. Oh, okay. To the future, October 21st, 2015. So just okay. still time to get us hoverboards. Yeah. <laughs> still time. Anybody got that? Right now. Yeah. Wasn't there a commercial that showed that? Yeah. There was a commercial that shows guys with the hoverboards. They showed it's on a track. It's on a track. It's not everywhere. It's on a track. Yeah. Uh, but the 2.0 code is out now. Yes, the 2.0 code is out now. Um, I believe yesterday morning published the uh, page, so you can now go to the downloads page and download all. Yeah. So I don't have a hub yet. I figure. Uh, that's why I'm here. So I don't have a hub. I'm here to check it out and see, okay, is this right for us? I'm sold. Um, where to from here? I figure I start with 2.0, not 1.3, um, saving that previous step. Um, but yeah, is there recipes, documentations for how to really get started? I've installed one of the older ones um, and played with it. But I see a bunch of packages. Do I contact individuals? There's a list where I can check and boom, they're automatically installed in my hub. How does this work? Uh, I 
Let's see. Uh, we do have documentation up. The, the Truo documentation is also published at the uh, same time. So if you go to these, uh, this should be all the uh, Truo documentation. And I will note for anyone who wasn't in the web and stuff yesterday, there is uh, a very quick upgrade kind of guide on this sort of what replacements you need to make um, in the code to get it up and running. And it should also fully detail some of the uh, directory changes we've made and so on. Uh, there are further, within uh, the documentation, there are different manuals, such as system administrator and some of the other areas here that will sort of go you through uh, the actual full process of setting up a hub. Uh, yeah, in fact, it's also on the download. Yeah. You could also look at our Amazon instance. So not, not just setting up one, right? I mean, this initial yeah. instance, but then even the process of really making it suit the needs of your users is way beyond just, you know, popping one in and opening it up. Right? Yeah. I, I'm specifically, I'm thinking about some of these other, uh, I don't know what to call them, tools, components, whatever. You know, customizing my instance of the hub for, for my users. Is that where I just, you know, pick what I've, I've seen here that I like, contact these people, and, uh, and, and bring on those components? Or how does that work? Oh, uh, I can say uh, uh, under the uh, documentation, we do actually have areas for the users and the managers. The managers area is probably uh, what you're thinking about, or it details kind of how to actually set up some of the stuff, how to use it, and uh, we are working on uh, building some pages that actually more fully detail uh, the, uh, all the features of specific component apps. Um, so because uh, one of the things we like to do. Um, Going forward, for when we have new hubs, is to actually have a full list that folks can check off. You know, these are the kind of areas I'm most interested in. And of course, you can always put in a support ticket. Uh, we will try to respond to you as quick as we can. Um, I guess jumping on to that and something, because we're a small team and we ran into this ourselves, is it would be nice even to open it up to the communities and things asking for best practices, because there's a lot of, um, and it's hard, because you guys are developing this stuff, like trying to do all of this yourself is too much. But, you know, there are lots of ways of doing these different things within the hub. But if you're just starting off trying to get your head around it, having kind of best practices, or here are two different examples of how we set up a wiki, or you can solve things this way. Having a space for that somewhere, and I think that even some of the conversations with people, you know, starting a, a, a hub for hub people, or finding a place to collectively do that, because there's sort of kind of places on your site to do it, but they're not really very helpful. Yeah, um, one of the things we've been really wanting to do to, uh, is actually set up a couple of courses. If we have our own course software, we wanted to set up a, a few sort of targeted courses like you know, uh, web developer 101, something like that, and also just, you know, getting to know and use your hub and uh, uh, some of that kind of stuff, exploring people and getting their standards. Uh, How soon can you start? <laughs> <laughs> well, we need to get the course built. Um, over here looking at people. <laughs> uh, uh, that is uh, absolutely one idea we've had. And also, one of the bigger things. Uh, just disseminating our own roadmap. We do have actually a roadmap kind of internally, which is uh, built from all the things that Mike was talking about, you know, some of the stuff like partners and uh, clients, you know, and we need, uh, we've been talking a lot lately on how do we just put that in a spot on the hub so that at least other people can see and know what's going on. And then the third thing is also a uh, sort of community marketplace kind of area where people can go and upload the extensions they created so that anyone else can just download it. Um, we really want to get that done. We actually have code that's probably about two quarters of the way done because we got, you know, too much, ran out of time, too much stuff kind of going on and we want to get that hopefully finished up and actually on the of your site so that anyone else can go and upload their extensions for anyone else. Hello. Um I'm also another new user, and I looked at some of the uh, the comments made here. Also about uh, 
starting up a new hub um, just from scratch and just kind of getting into it. So I've, I'm working on a new hub uh, for uh, kind of an internal one for the company I work for. And um, one of the questions that we had was uh, on the development of the Red Hat Enterprise Linux version of Hub Zero. In particular, I'm noticing that it's still listed as in beta version, and also that um, I wasn't the guy who started up the hub, but the person who did said that he was having some trouble with it. And I was wondering if you'd comment on the development of that in conjunction with the Debian version. What do you think? Yeah, Nick, yeah. do you want to field it since Dave is in here? I could make it up. Uh, the Red Hat release is still in beta, mostly because we haven't uh, put up any of our production hubs on Red Hat yet. But we'll be doing so real soon. Yeah. Yeah. Too. I think the Amazon version is Red Hat. Yeah, it is. So uh, the more we've done with Amazon, the more we use that as a testing ground. It's helped us improve the, the Red Hat. Internally, the hosted hubs that we do at Purdue, we're trying to switch them from Debian to Red Hat and integrating Puppet along the way as a way of managing those. So the, the further along we get with Puppet and the more we use Red Hat internally, I think the more it will shape up. We just haven't taken the beta label off yet, even though it's gotten, um, geez, orders of magnitude better than what it was two years ago. Uh, but, you know, still maybe uh, your mileage may vary. So if you're using Red Hat, feedback information to us, let us know what's broken, that's how we fix it. Right, I would also say, give me your card and we'll yeah. work it out. Because I know Dave's on quite a, working a lot of those tickets, so we can make sure we stay in contact. Okay. A um, couple of um, small questions. One is just some time back you were talking about inter hub authentication, and I don't know if that's anywhere on the radar of the map with being able to log into one but be authenticated to um, communicate or see information in another. So that's one question. And I definitely agree to the best practices thing and then lessons learned and sharing that would be very valuable for everybody. Um, from the perspective of the roadmap, it would be great to get that out actually on maybe Hub Zero, maybe on the calendar or something so that that way yeah. it is. Right now it's currently thinking about it being Hub Zero forward slash roadmap. So, so hopefully, yeah, I'd like to get a menu item up and we can start populating that at the very least. And then the last question is, you're actually doing a development in the open source and do you actually have people, allow people to join in the development efforts, or, or is it only through the Hub Zero challenges uh, to contribute to the code? Oh, no, we have one. Except code that uh, anyone wants to submit to us. Uh, we just haven't got a ton of people submitting code. <laughs> Yeah, the, the Hub Hero Challenge, the whole point of it is to get people involved, number one, to train them, and number two, to get them to build things that they can contribute. But, you know, if someone just last night, you know, did something on their own without the Hub Hero Challenge and wants to contribute it, they do it the same way as everybody else. You fill out the form, you assign the copyright, you put the code in for, for um, you know, uh, approval, um, some uh, over, oversight and approval, and then when it's uh, tested and approved, then it just becomes part of the release. And regardless whether you uh, uh, were in a Hub Hero Challenge or not, you go up on the wall as a, as a hero if you contribute. Um, in terms of the inner hub, uh, you can speak better to this, but I, the, the problem again is that right now, each hub is basically its own pool of users, its own LDAP. And so when you move from one hub to another, the problem is the scene, the scene that you have with any other service. Like another hub looks like a different service, like, like a, you know, grant a database or whatever. It's something that the hub's never seen before. So for example, you have an identity on NCIP Hub, but that doesn't mean that you're a user of NanoHub. And, and if you were a user of NanoHub, you'd have a different identifier because you'd be, you would have registered at a different point in time. And so getting rid of that seam or, or making, you know, what do you do when someone gets onto a hub they've never been on before? Uh, how do they really use a federated identity or what does that mean in the system anymore? I don't think we've solved that yet. Um, but, you know, as we do more and more federation things, I think maybe that's something that will fall into place. Any last uh, 
Somebody gets a chance to make the last comment or the last question. Uh, yeah, my last comment is today is Emily Kaiser's birthday. I was wondering if we could all sing happy birthday to her. Oh, and yeah. Next door. <laughs> and, um, and, and before I forget, I also want to uh, thank Betsy uh, and, and all of the folks, Shirley, and all the folks that have been helping to organize this conference. Because organizing something like this is, is a, a chore and uh, uh, there's a lot of work to do. And I really had nothing to do with it except for the parts that went wrong. So uh, congratulations to Betsy and Shirley and everyone who helped. Thanks.